It's my great pleasure to introduce someone now that uh, we are really quite lucky was available to speak with all of us. Um, our closing speaker has dedicated so much of her career to international justice. She is an inspiration to lawyers and humanitarians around the world. Ms. Louisa Bohr has served as the UN Commissioner for Human Rights, as the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, as a Canadian Supreme Court Justice, and as President of the International Crisis Group. In a move that illustrates the importance that UN Secretary General Guterres places on the issue of migration, he appointed Ms. Abor, his A-team, as the UN Special Representative for International Migration a year ago. In this capacity, she leads advocacy, policy, and coordination efforts on international migration among all UN entities. Obviously, this is no small task, but one that she is eminently qualified for. We are so pleased and privileged to have her with us, and a vote of confidence, if anybody can pull this tough issue together, we know it is you. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Commissioner Labora. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. I spoke this morning to a group of NGOs, and I said to them at the outset of my remarks that addressing them gave me exactly the same uh, sort of apprehension as the time that I decided it was time to have that sex talk with my children. <laughs> And this was based on two, uh, there were two bases for my apprehension. One is, I had no idea how much they already knew. <laughs> and even more, I was not sure they wanted to hear very much from me. <laughs> so when I came to this event, I thought, well, that's very different. It's a bunch of lawyers. That's my stuff. But then I realized I haven't done a lot of lawyering in the recent past. In fact, maybe since I left the Supreme Court of Canada, I haven't done a lot of hardcore legal work. So at first, I had told the organizers, no, I'm just going to make a few remarks. And then, of course, I got a bit carried away in my conceptual thinking, so I wrote it all up, as we almost always do when we approach issues from a, a legal perspective. So if you'll bear with me, I will share these thoughts with you, and then I hope we can have a conversation that will be, um, maybe that will address the issues that are on your mind on this. As was mentioned today, about a year ago, the Secretary General asked me to take on this process, which is essentially of accompanying member states of the United Nations in the decision that they made in September 2016 to launch a process which will be completed at the end of this year in an intergovernmental conference, which will take place in Morocco in December, to equip themselves with a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. So it is a, uh, it's a member state-led process. The negotiations are very much between member states, but as the representative of the Secretary General, I coordinate all the expertise in the United Nations systems from ILO to UNODC to UNHCR to all the, the various players for policy advice and of course technical support accompanying this process. As part of that, we produce the Secretary General's report which was launched in January which represents his vision for the direction that international migration should take and in a nutshell, it's a vision that is people-centered forward-looking, uh, if only to accommodate the anticipated demographic needs that the world will experience in the next coming decades, uh, and very much based at its core on a system of improved international cooperation, obviously to secure uh, a migration, a human mobility system that will be safer, uh, more orderly, and more regular. So as, and I came to this issue, I don't have a migration background, I have a diverse, <laughs> it's fair to say, background, as in she can't keep a job, as <laughs> some would say, but that's, that's for another conversation. So I, as I came to this mandate, and as we very often do, I think, in light of our professional training, I was searching for coherence. You know, what is 
that bring some kind of intellectual coherence and clarity in a field that I felt, apart from the refugee part, which is coherent because it's governed by law, by a convention, the rest of it, the 258 million migrants, that is people who in today's world live and work in a country other than their country of birth or nationality, uh, in an international framework, there's no organizing principle to deal with their movement and their settlement in countries of destination. So I was searching for coherence. And when I started this process, uh, I should say, and this will be the topic of my talk, forced migration, which is very much a subject of your conversation, has been, in a sense, my siren song. As I explored at length the distinction between forced and voluntary migration, as I thought was gonna be the potential golden thread that would bring this clarity in particular to the vexing uh, issue of irregular migration, and I pause here to say I use the expression irregular migration, which is now sort of consecrated in international circles, often referred to here in particular as undocumented migrants, in preference to illegal migration, which is a very toxic, it's a term that has been hijacked by those who like to think of everybody in a situation of irregularity as a criminal. So we try to push away. The problem with the term irregular migration is that it could be understood to mean infrequent. You know, irregular has two meanings, but anyway, that's now the term that is used. So I really thought that the question of forced versus voluntary migration was the key to bringing some clarity uh, to this issue. And after, and I worked, of course, with a small team of specialists, and they were very skeptical of that approach. And I pushed and pushed until I hit the brick wall. And um, at this particular stage of my thinking, on the world scene, I don't believe that forced displacement or forced migration is a useful concept. I hope you're sufficiently in shock to stay with me. <laughs> At first sight, I think it's a very attractive one, especially for lawyers, because it evokes an expansion of the fundamental ideas on which the Refugee Convention is based. But this conceptual proximity to the refugee protection reg regime is in fact one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons why it's not, in my view, a useful conceptual basis for managing international migration today. And let me try to explain why I think this way and offer an alternative, which unfortunately may look less anchored in the rule of law, but I hope I'll persuade you uh, that it can still be anchored in a proper understanding of the rule of law in this kind of environment. The international protection regime that is extended to refugees, that is persons fleeing persecution, understood very broadly, is based essentially on a combination of two ideas. One, that they were forced to move, and two, that they deserve protection. I think it would be very difficult today to find consensus in the international environment on any expansion of the protection entitlement offered to uh, people forced to move and also deserving of protection. In fact, even the most obvious um, candidate category for such an expansion, the one most likely to, general, to generate consensus would be the so-called climate migrants. Even that one would quickly run into difficulty in, in the determination of that voluntariness issue. Were they really forced to move? So apart from cases of islands disappearing into the sea or possibly sudden catastrophic natural disasters, they would likely be very strong disagreement as to, for instance, when the slow onset of climate change would create conditions where forced displacement rather than adaptation measures would be accepted as the only alternative and thereby would trigger a set of international obligations. In other words, using that concept, uh, that's this question of voluntariness, is tangled into the infinite web of circumstances under which people make the decision to move and to cross borders. And it begs the question of whether the appreciation of voluntariness uh, is based on an objective or a subjective standard or some combination of both. 
and injected into this analysis invariably would be the question of merit or entitlement or desert as a precondition to a claim for international protection. So I think as you start going down this route to start developing a kind of management framework for international migration, you very quickly hit that brick wall of, de of developing enough of a consensus beyond persecution in the refugee convention as to what is forced and what is actually optional, which is very well captured in the fact that in our terminology, we talk about refugees and everybody else we call economic migrants, which again evokes, in my view, the question of choice. It doesn't evoke the poverty as an irresistible driver of migration. So one often hears the very appealing mantra, migration by choice, not by necessity. This, I think, suggests a welcome approach to the subject of migration from the migrant rather than from the state's point of view. But as with many slogans, it contains a fair part of deception. What it, suge what it suggests is that as we strive to design a fair, safe, orderly, and effective system to regulate human mobility, free freedom of choice of the migrant should be the main or even a relevant consideration. In reality, reducing necessity will not necessarily increase choice. Put more bluntly, reducing necessity will not remove the paradox, the legal paradox, that although people have the fundamental human right to leave their country, they don't have the right to go anywhere else. And it's obvious enough today that not all people who would choose to migrate will succeed in doing so, at least not in doing so legally. Many people have no choice but to leave their country of birth. While not persecuted, many leave their country in circumstances that hardly qualify as voluntary. They may be so adversely affected by climate change that they can no longer survive at home. They may face conditions of poverty, hardship, or such a profound lack of opportunities and hope that they have no alternative but to leave. While they may not qualify for the legal protection regime afforded to refugees, their predicament, especially if their flight is part of a large flow of people on the move, often makes them, in reality, if not in law today, undistinguishable from refugees. Related to voluntariness, there's also, and also analogized to the system of treatment for refugees, is the concept of legality. Without overly simplifying the matter, the less voluntary the migration, the more it's likely to have recourse to illegal means. Conversely, the more the decision to move is based on the exercise of informed free choice, free from coercive conditions, the more likely it is to proceed through legal channels. So this connection is also reflected in the context um, of refugees where, quote, illegal entry in the flight from persecution cannot be a ground from exclusion from protection. In the same way, there are linkages between legality, that is moving through legal channels, and protection. But outside the refugee realm, that connection between legality, moving lawfully, legally, regularly, and protection in the non-refugee context, I, in my view, that connection is completely perverse. For here, in general, again, the more irregular the migration is, the greater the vulnerability of the migrant, and hence the greatest need for protection and assistance. And yet, less, not more, protection is available to irregular migrants. And finally, there are linkages between voluntariness and labor issues. Again, in general terms, the more voluntary the migration is, the more likely it will meet labor market needs. Conversely, the less voluntary it is, refugees, natural disaster, the less responsive it is, it is to labor market needs. So in a, <coughs> sorry, in a sense, when a country of destination is required by law to take in refugees, uh, if the refugee is an engineer, but you have a need for barbers, uh, the, the, the match uh, will have to be accommodated by the country of destination. Um, 
but when the, the, uh, the migration is voluntary and through legal channels, the more responsive it can be uh, to, to labor market opportunities. So it's because of all these interconnections that voluntariness may appear as the golden thread, but I believe in today's world, it is at once over and under inclusive. It is not possible in my view to design today a cogent international migration policy that would be responsive to all the people who move involuntarily, people that are genuinely forcibly displaced without making invidious decisions about the validity of their choice. And to be frank, I think there's currently no appetite to expand in a binding way forms of international protection for non-refugee migrants. So, having explored that and hit a brick wall, I turn to what do I think is a more useful approach as we are now trying to, to find coherence in developing this global compact. I believe a more useful approach is to stay away from the reason why people decide to migrate and focus on their situation in transit and in destination country. And the, more, the most useful element here is to design policies that will be responsive to their vulnerabilities. Um, this is not to say that we should abandon effort to reduce the so-called migration by necessity, far from it. Reducing the drivers of migration, as it's often put, is an objective actually that far outreaches migration objectives. And yet, even the expression reducing the drivers of migration is conveniently ambiguous. For one thing, it should clearly mean reducing the drivers of irregular migration. And that, of course, includes not only the so-called push factors, poverty, the bad governance, and so on, that push people to leave, but also the pull factors, such as the attraction of work in the informal, often exploitative economies of rich countries. But even when it clearly focuses on countries of origin, does it aim to reduce only involuntary or forced displacement or migration altogether? And if it's the latter case, it would be a very strange policy objective altogether since well-managed migration has prov proven hugely beneficial to all concerns, to the migrants, to their countries of origin, and to their countries of destination. So surely it's absurd to say we should try to reduce the drivers of migration. Uh, in some countries, actually, there's a call for my, uh, certainly in my own country, in Canada, the policies, and will remain, I'm sure, for the foreseeable future, is for Canada to take in the equivalent of 1% of its population a year, not as refugees, that's a separate humanitarian gesture, but as migrants to support the economy. So reducing poverty, uh, tackling climate change are all desirable, desirable goods in and of themselves, and not just as tools to reduce migration, but as tools to reduce involuntary and irregular migration. And so as we strive to combat those drivers of migration which effectively remove the element of choice from an individual's decision whether or not to move, greater progress is required to expand safe legal channels for regular migration. Without this, too many will continue to fall prey to the dangers of irregular migrations and the predatory practices of smugglers. Absent a new legally binding framework to tackle forced displacement, which I don't believe is within our immediate reach, I believe that good practices of international cooperation and solidarity should be encouraged and will yield more tang tangible benefits for the greatest numbers. Migration is not only about people, but it's about large numbers of people competing for limited opportunities. A fundamental choice will have to be made between seeking to maximize the full implementations of rights and entitlements for a few, or advocating for a share of opportunity for the larger numbers. This is the kind of difficult policy choice that norm advocates are often unwilling to make, but that will have to be addressed if migration is to be an effective tool to reduce inequalities within and between countries, as this concept is now enshrined in the Sustainable Development Goals as objectives for the United Nations uh, 2030 agenda. 
UN member states, as I said, are currently negotiating a global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. Although this will not be as often repeated, this will be as often repeated a non-legally binding document, I believe that the expression safe, orderly, regular migration evokes creating a law-based environment aimed to reduce, if not eliminate, unsafe, disorderly, irregular migration. So if nothing else, it implies promoting the availability and use of legal pathways to migration while discouraging recourse to other avenues of border crossing or of settlements in foreign countries. Importantly, in my view, it must rest on a proper understanding of the rule of law, one that I have endorsed throughout my work in many, many, many aspects of many legal systems. And that understanding is a complete repudiation of rule by law, which carries, of course, the danger of using laws as tools of injustice. Rather, it reflects the true purpose of law in a free society, which is to liberate rather than to restrain. In fact, this, in my view, has never been ex uh, better expressed by the French cleric Lacordaire, who said, he didn't say it in English, so I paraphrase. He said, between the rich and the poor, between the master and the servant, between the strong and the weak, it is freedom that oppresses and the law that sets free. The objective of putting in place enhanced international cooperation on the many aspects of migration reflects that vision of the rule of law. Enhanced legal protection for forced displacement may come further down the road, not today. Today, the task at hand is to help set many, many people free. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Louise. That was really an excellent, detailed, and thought-provoking set of remarks. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, if you were to categorize this group of irregular migrants in terms of those who are most in need of either a legal regime or, 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 or let's say, a more regular legal path to movement, as well as protection, would you be able to say well, like the three categories? Would it be victims, you know, other than those who are defined refugees, what people do you think are mo we should focus our attentions on? And my second very brief question is, in, within Europe, you're seeing, leaving the U.S. out because it's chaos on this issue, but Europeans seem to be very much focused on giving resources to fragile states in order to, you, as you say, tamp down the driver's displacement. And in fact, it has turned out that their refugee spending has declined as they have given more f spending to this for area. So do you have any thoughts on that as well? Thank you. Um, so on this question of vulnerability of irregular migrants, I think to revert to the expertise of migration experts, I think it's important to distinguish between what they call stocks and flows. In other words, I think it's really useful to distinguish between irregular migration and irregular migrants. So irregular migration evokes flows, people on the move, and their vulnerability for the most part, for the most part, is in their transit. Uh, the crisis in Europe in the last couple of years it was a good example of that, and God knows there are many, many more, you know, from South Sudan to Uganda, but they're not on our radar screen. It's the vulnerability of people who, or first of all, let's start with the basic principle. The minute you step outside the geographic territory of your country, you, have, you increase your vulnerability. As a tourist, maybe not very, as a diplomat, almost not at all. As a tourist, a little bit. As a regular migrant, as an irregular migrant quite immensely. Now, what are the attributes of vulnerability? For instance, in large mixed flows of refugees and migrants, you know, when you're part of hundreds of thousands of people on the move, it's very contextual. 
Uh, it depends um, how sophisticated the predatory practices of traffickers and smugglers is in place, uh, uh, gender-based and sexual violence, how much that's in place, um, you know, the networks of smugglers, how well-equipped, sophisticated they are, whether you're on foot in the winter. I mean, it's very contextual, and I believe and what we put forward in the Secretary General's report is they, they should be a four-step responses. The first one should always be a humanitarian response. Saving lives, number one, whether it's rescue at sea, whatever it is. That's regardless of migratory status, of reasons, voluntary or forced displacement. It's a purely um, humanitarian gesture. When that has been crossed, the next step is status determination, because for those entitled to refugee, international protection under the Refugee Convention, this has to be triggered at the earliest opportunity. That leaves, in the case of, for instance, uh, the, the Mediterranean transit from Libya, a large portion of migrants who will not qualify as refugee. And however, who on the ground in reality are undistinguishable from refugees. They're in the same boat with no more money, and in many cases, the return option seriously is not real. They can, no, not because they're persecuted within the meaning of the Refugee Convention, but for a variety of reasons, including the fact that, their, that they don't want to go back and their country of origin won't even recognize them as their own citizens, again, for a variety of reasons. So there, the law has nothing to offer. And what we put forward is that in such cases, return should be explored, safe, dignified return, but if it's not an option, we can only call on the international community uh, to step forward because staying in that kind of transit, particularly if your transit is in Libya, is not a sustainable option either. Currently, as I said, the law, international law has nothing to offer and vulnerability has to be determined in a very contextual manner. The source of vulnerability can be, can have originated in the country of origin, can have accrued in transit, maybe you were hurt, raped, or, or um, uh, maybe you have an inherent vulnerability, children. I don't put women in that category. I don't think they're the same as children, but I think children have an inherent vulnerability increased if they're separated from their families. So I think that's the way to approach it. This is very different from the vulnerability of irregular migrants, stocks, existing population who have finished their transit, who usually, for the most part worldwide, have actually entered the country of destination through perfectly legal means with a visa, but have become irregular by overstaying the terms of their visas and so on. So then you have, a lar in some countries, in this country, large stocks of existing irregular migrants. And their vulnerability, of course, comes from their irregular status. In part, not exclusively, some are inherently uh, more vulnerable, trafficked women, for instance, but others are simply vulnerable because in countries that don't have any, whatever, sanctuary cities, firewalls, and so on, to give them access at least to basic legal services, uh, basic, basic fundamental health care, education for their children, their vulnerability is it's very different. It's also contextual, but very different. What is the response to that? Again, uh, a perfectly legal response is deportation or expulsion. But it's not the only one. In many, many circumstances, as their irregularity is on a spectrum from very bad people who cross the border with 17 false passports in their pocket and frankly could be returned the next day, to people who've settled for 25 years in a country working in the informal economy, not having breached the law in any other fashion than on their migratory status. So irregularity is on a spectrum, and I think the response should be on a spectrum from expulsion, which is a very drastic one, often extremely inappropriate, to shades of regularization from temporary work permits to eventually path to citizenship. So, what we are trying to promote is that member states should be encouraged to make appropriate choices. The international system will not force any particular model from deportation to path to citizenship on any country unwilling to adopt that as a national policy. But if we can at least inject the idea, 
that irregularity, whatever its cause, creates vulnerabilities on a spectrum and that the responses should be appropriate, uh, that would be very helpful. Your second question was about, um, it's very popular in Europe, the idea of increasing international aid to discourage migration, essentially to try to get people, to get countries to, to be more developed so their citizens can stay at home. Uh, this actually is very ironic because all the scientific evidence shows that at least from one point to another point of development, increased development increases migration. Put another way, poor people can't move. And as much as they, or if they can, they become just internally displaced. We're talking here border crossing. So increased development, at least at one level, increases opportunities to then spring out um, and do better. So it's only when we will have reached a much, much more advanced level of development that uh, it will not actually be a factor to induce or favor increased migration. Um, and there's another aspect that I wanted to point out on these policies. Oh, yes, and the other one is they'll have to spend a huge amount of money because migrants, as you know, send home remittances, right? Which last year were worth about $600 billion. That's three times the total amount of international development aid that migrants in rich countries send home. So every time you take a migrant and send him home, that country loses remittances. Just to make out for that, you'd have to increase by three times the development aid. To get better, you'd have to increase by sixfold. I don't think there's a lot of public appetite to spend taxpayers' money to do that. And the money the migrants send home are only 15% of their income. The 85% they, they spend in the country of destination. So the economics of that, I think, are gonna be very difficult to use that argument to reduce migration, I think. Yes, I don't know where to turn, I don't know you. I don't want to ignore anybody. Thank you, Ashley Benetti, Georgetown Law Human Rights Institute. Uh, you mentioned the importance and the emphasis on responsibility sharing and international cooperation. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to treat countries that refuse to cooperate. One example that comes to mind is Hungary. What can we do to ensure protection of those vulnerable populations, the refugees that are either caught in um, border camps at the fence or being refulled to unsafe places? Yeah, you, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of European leaders who very much like to have the answer to that question. I mean, this goes to what can you do in the international environment, either as an inducement or a, or a sanction or a threat to make countries do what they don't want to do. And the answer is not very much. And that's even more so in environments where the, the regional international cooperation is so tightly, uh, so mature as in the European Union. So if you can't even make it happen then, there, you can imagine how difficult it is to make it happen elsewhere. A lot of the good work on migration is done through bilateral agreements and multi or mini lateral agreements. But the reality is, and that's why, you know, I am not discouraged by the fact that this compact will not be legally binding. The Convention on the Rights of, Migra <coughs> of Migrant Workers and Members of Their Family was negotiated for more than a decade, and it is technically legally binding, it's a convention. It's not been ratified by a single Western country. So you could spend a lot of energy developing a legally binding system that will never work. At this stage, where we are in an environment where public opinion is not particularly receptive or friendly to human mobility writ large, I think we'll do better um, essentially not giving up, but bypassing the those who are just not part of the conversation, and trying to develop good practices and so on uh, among those who wish. The African Union, for instance, Africa is very alive to its demographic projections, which, um, you know, it's not rocket science. Huh? The population experts take uh, fertility rates and mortality rates, neither of which are easy to 
interfere with, at least in the medium term. And their current projections for 2050 is that Africa will grow by 45% of its population. So Africans are talking, and most, of course, of the African migration is continental, it's south-south. I mean, it's only a fraction that goes outside the continent, and not all to Europe or America, many to the Middle East, to the Gulf countries. So in light of that, Africans are talking now the Kigali Protocol towards an African passport and, and kind of increased continental mobility to capitalize of what can be, if properly managed, the demographic dividend of a large working age population coming to them while the working age population of the West is in very serious decline. You spoke of an orderly immigration system, and um, which I think would be a great idea. Uh, <laughs> but how would that work in times of crisis? Well, that's, that's the thing. I think what got us to where we are today in the United Nations, I mean, 10 years ago, you couldn't even mention the word migration in the UN. Uh, states were always willing to talk about and go different distance on the mobility of goods, the mobility of capital, and not the mobility of people. It took the perceived, and I say the perceived crisis in Europe, I, I don't want to be dismissive, but the reality is when a, when a continent of 500 million people is in catastrophic crisis because there's a million knocking at the door, you have a, you have a management problem, <laughs> don't you think? Um, so, but I think this was the trigger for this exercise, which is an effort to better manage all the indicators, uh, demographic projection of demographic growth and the distribution of the world's population, the very predictable effect of climate change, particularly the slower onset desertification and, and so on, are such that today has to be the beginning of a conversation about international cooperation. State sovereignty is still the godlike figure in this debate. States have the absolute prerogative, <clears throat> indeed responsibility, to determine who's on their territory, for how long, under what terms, subject to, obviously, domestic law, and some in very clear international law principles, such as non refoulement But apart from that, it's their prerogative. It's a clear state sovereignty issue. But by definition, the minute a person moves between two states, there's an is issue of state interdependence. The better we persuade them that it's in everybody's interest to start, a this is the beginning, not the end of the road, of a conversation on the better management of human mobility, including the capacity to anticipate, predict, uh, and manage large, sudden, large flows of mixed refugees and migrants in response to either political or um, environmental upheaval, of which we have every reason to believe we will see more again in the future. So that's what we do. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much. Um, this is very unorderly, but my question is about stateless people, and nobody's really spoken much today about the situation of the Rohingya. Um, so I wonder what your office or others are doing on that question. How do you begin to engage that conversation? Um, and stateless people are on the move as well, and perhaps the most vulnerable. Yeah. Well, actually, that's quite interesting because, see, this is an area, there is a convention on statelessness, which shows the limits. I mean, I don't want to appear a cynic having devoted a lot of my energies in the international law environment, but it's not law as we otherwise know it, right? It's a, and so, so statelessness, I think, this effort, well, let me backtrack a bit. I see what we're doing today a little bit like what the Earth Summit in Rio, the Rio Summit of 1992 is to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. It's the beginning of a consciousness about the environment and so on that led us to this. What we're doing today on migration, so much more work will have to be done and we are nowhere near ready. For instance, there's now a text that is being negotiated by member states 
It has whatever it is, 22 objectives and actionable commitments and so on, including to reduce statelessness or at least not to create additional uh, conditions that will create statelessness to, to reduce trafficking and so on. It, has, it hasn't touched some of the very difficult issues of citizenship dual citizenship, acquisition of citizenship. Each one of them is determined currently by national law. Um, so as I said, we are at the beginning of dealing with these issues. The spirit is very much, at least the rhetoric, is not to increase statelessness, if anything, to try to reduce it. The reality is the Rohingya is a very good example of that, of a population that has been citizenship deprived before our very eyes for the for a very long time, and it's not until there's a very acute crisis that there's some mobilization. Again, nowhere near the mobilization in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh as there was in, At in Greece and on, in Lampedusa and so on, which felt a lot more on our doorstep. Uh, but it's the world we live in, we need, and I think that this global compact will be, the text will be agreed upon in July, but the intergovernmental conference at the head of state and head of government's level will be in Marrakesh in Morocco, December 10 and 11. I really hope that between July, when we have the text of the global compact, that we'll be able to mobilize, particularly the private sector. The private sector is a friendly giant on this issue. They're very friendly to mobility. Uh, not so much at low-skilled labors, but we could persuade them to get on the program here. Um, they're, but they're very timid vis-a-vis -vis governments who are less friendly. But after we have the compact, we have to get to Marrakesh with this spirit of uh, this is the beginning of a chapter where lawyers, activists, and so on will need to bring their skills together to start tackling some of these kinds of issues that are now too esoteric at this stage of the process. Thank you so much, Ms. Zabor. My name is Neha Mishra, and I'm with the Solidarity Center. We're an international labor rights NGO, and I've been working a lot on the Global Compact for Migration. Um, and I have to say I'm very thankful that it's not binding because I'm very scared of what's going to come out <laughs> given some of the rhetoric, and that's my question for you. When you're talking about irregular migration, the biggest issue that we've been hearing about in the negotiations since January is governments pushing back against the idea that irregular migrants should even be covered by the Global Compact for Migration. And I was saying this morning one of the things we've seen is countries in the EU even going against directives that they have where irregular migrants are covered under certain EU directives, et cetera. And so I'm really curious, given what you're saying about irregular migrants needing protection and moving towards that regime, what you think the Global Compact would be able to accomplish there, because that's not where we're hearing a lot of the states talk how they're talking about irregular migrants. And again, I'm really worried that you know irregular migrants are covered by human rights instruments. They are covered by ILO. Um, conventions, et cetera, but we're hearing states say the opposite on the floor of the UN during these negotiations. And mm. so what do you think about mm. that? Well, first of all, I find it it's a little absurd to say we can't talk about irregular migration and irregular migrants. This is a compact, a global compact for, 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 safe, orderly, and regular migration. Presumably, it means attempting to reduce unsafe, irregular, disorderly migration. Now you could say, well, okay, let's build walls, lock the doors. Well, I, I think that most of us are past that simplistic approach. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, but, no, but essentially, I, re I think if, if if we're serious about looking at these issues, it's not a question of having a debate as to whether migration is a good thing or a bad thing. It's like hearsay. It's a thing, right? You start, uh, it's a thing. They are currently about 3.4% of the population of the world who are migrants, who have crossed, and the definition, there are many definitions, but the one the UN uses in global terms is people who have lived for at least a year in a country other than their country of birth or origin. That doesn't capture flows, current flows, right? It's populations of migrants. ILO uses more migrant workers, there are different, uh, different standards. People move, they've always moved. 
Now, what kind of trend are we seeing? In the last 15 years, this proportion has grown from 2.7 to 3.4. Is that a bump in the road, or is this a trend that will continue? I don't know. But there's no suggestion that 50% of the world is going to move. It's, never, it's not part of the history. There's also no suggestion that nobody will move. I mean, it's, that's the, it's a thing. And, <laughs> and therefore, it's not particularly helpful to be pro or against migration. It's like you're pro or against the weather. It's <laughs> not very helpful. It's, it's just a little more helpful to deal with it in a smart way. For some countries, at this point in their history, uh, they're not particularly uh, looking to increase their population. That's fine. Maybe 20, 30, 50 years ago, it was the opposite. I mean, Europeans were migrants. I mean, they certainly colonized my country. And so Canada today is a very big country of immigration. There are many countries who are actually, in fact, most countries today are a bit of everything, origin, transit, destination, and so on. Um, Europeans are the ones who, the European continent is the one that produces the most migrants, as I defined them before, largely because they have legal channels to do that very easily. Is that desirable? It is for Europe. Maybe it's not for somebody else. You know, Canada is not Singapore. Nobody's suggesting that there should be a universal model. But it seems to me that to enhance state sovereignty, that is national policies that will work, whatever these national policies are, you need international cooperation. It's not going to work if you have a national policy that your immediate neighbors resist, obstruct, or do not favor. If we could just get some traction on this idea, that's where we are at this stage. I think we're going to make progress. But if some are not even willing to have that conversation, they've made up their mind, migration is not a thing, it's a bad thing, well, what can I tell you? I'm afraid I've joined, uh, I've drawn the short straw and I have to bring an end to <laughs> Ms. Arbor's remarks. Um, but Louise, thank you very much. You've been... Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for remarks that were, were smart, sharp, thoughtful, and funny. <laughs> And I think that that is a combination that gives me hope that you're the person who has been charged with, uh, at this moment in time, uh, leading the effort. Um, so I'm, I'm, we're honored to have had you here today. Thank you. Um, my name is Linda Bishai. I am the Director of Research Evaluation and Learning at ABA Rowley. I've spoken with many of you uh, either in person today or by phone or by email. Um, and this has been um, a, a great project, and uh, it's been a wonderful and thoughtful day. Uh, I'd like to um, thank a few people um, who have made it possible for me to, to stand up here and, and take all the credit, which isn't mine at all. Um, I really would like to say thank you to all of the panelists who have come and, and given their time and, and their expertise and, and shared their thoughts with us. The moderators, the rapporteurs who are maybe a little invisible, but who I need very much to work on the final conference report. Um, the work will continue tomorrow with our expert working group session um, for much of the day, and we will work on identifying some of the striking and key observations from today, from the rapporteur's notes, um, and from our discussions on where we think the gaps and potential is in the global compacts. Um, we very much want to be part of the process to help those compacts move forward and keep going and, uh, and, and build on, on what the foundations are, are currently are. Um, also, uh, I will be developed based on um, all of these discussions. Look, look out for that. Um, th that will summarize all of the panels. So I know uh, many of you probably felt a little frustrated that you couldn't go to all of them at, at the same time. Uh, the report will help address that. You'll be able to get a taste of some of the, the key observations and learning that was coming out of those uh, multiple breakout panels. 
Uh, I also do very much want to thank um, the number of uh, ABA st uh, Roley staff who um, volunteered uh, to, to help us today logistically, um, friends and staff volunteers who you've seen in many of the breakout rooms, but very particular the outreach team um, who have made all of this possible and have tweeted it all day long. <laughs> um, and I, I want to uh, call out by name um, Claudia, Kyle, Jeremy, Hoban, um, David, and of course Lindsay um, who has really taken this bull by the horns and wrestled it to the ground and made sure that it happened um, very smoothly. Um, I am very indebted to them and I please join me in thanking them. And I am also keenly aware that on the other side of that door is a very nice reception that our wonderful caterers have laid out, and I do not want to keep you from that. Um, I would, uh, let's pretend it's Friday, and, uh, and enjoy yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>